very much and also greeting. great thanks to uh, Nico Franzmeier. It's a pleasure uh, to be part of the series. So I'm now going to share my screen. Oh, it's already on presentation mode, I think. Can you see everything? Yes, it's fine. Okay, perfect. So um, I'm going to talk about um, episodic memory, uh, as um, Michael said, um, and in particular about the maintenance of a youth-like functional encoding network in old age uh, in the face of Alzheimer's disease biomarkers. So this is really research conducted at the German Center for Neurodegenerative Diseases. I have one disclaimer to make. I'm a co-founder of uh, Neotiv. So Endel Tobing was already mentioned. He is really the um, eminent scientist who coined the term episodic memory as the type of memory that allows us to um, memorize unique personal events. So novel events that we experience and um, therefore, um, and we know that you know, episodic memory of course is one of the memory faculties and cognitive faculties that is impaired very early on in Alzheimer's disease. So impairment of encoding into episodic memory in Alzheimer's disease is something that is of interest to understand how Alzheimer's disease affects um, memory functions and we know already from you know, numerous studies that brain activity patterns during encoding in Alzheimer's disease are different from what we would typically observe in young adults. And I'm very interested in characterizing that difference and understanding um, how we can interpret it and what it actually means for our understanding of, the, um, uh, of Alzheimer's disease. So, what I'm going to talk about today is maintaining a young or youth-like episodic memory encoding brain activity pattern. So a functional similarity to young adults. And um, the, base, the premise is very simple. The idea is that if a person is able to maintain functional similarity to young adults, this really indicates that episodic memory is not impaired. So I will talk about Alzheimer's disease biomarkers and brain activity patterns as we measure them with fMRI. Of course, you all know that Alzheimer's disease is characterized when we look at the pathology by two types of you know, core pathologies, tau pathology, typically originating um, in the um, rhinal sulcus and then spreading along designated neuronal pathways. And then we have Alzheimer's uh, amyloid pathology that is much more distributed. And originally, at least when it comes to plaques, can even spare medial temporal lobe regions. So these pathologies are, uh, you know, it's of great interest to understand how these pathologies interact and how, they, how their regional um, uh, distribution pattern is over the course of Alzheimer's disease. Today, I will focus mostly on amyloid pathology. So this is really the framework within which um, my talk today is, you know, can be can be placed. Um, we know that when we look at brain structure and brain function, age obviously has a strong influence, and then obviously also Alzheimer's disease pathology can influence brain structure and function. Age, in turn, has a strong influence on the emergence of pathology, and. Um, when it comes to brain function, we know that there can be also bidirectional influences in terms of the level of activity patterns affecting pathology. Then in turn, brain function and brain structure can influence each other mutually. And both structure and function then have an impact, of course, on cognitive performance. Now, when we think about um, how the different, these different players actually impact on each other, um, then, uh, and you know, what, what modifies this impact, then we have to, then immediately we come to the terms resistance, resilience, and reserve. 
And here you see um, you know, how, how I view uh, these terms. And of course, there may be slightly different views. So in the framework I'm going to present, resistance is um, something that um, basically modifies the impact of age on pathology. So um, prevents pathology from emerging in the course of aging. Resilience refers to uh, factors that reduce the impact of pathology on brain structure and brain function. So the ability, for instance, to maintain brain function in the face of pathology would be resilience. And reserve modifies the relationship between brain structure, brain function, and cognitive performance. So reserve really is um, um, the most immediate relationship between pathology, brain structure, brain function, and the cognitive readouts that, that we have. So today I will focus on amyloid pathology as a pathology. In terms of brain structures, I will focus on medial temporal lobe, on the medial temporal lobe, particularly looking at medial temporal lobe volumes. And in terms of brain activity, as I said, um, this, we will look at fMRI of encoding and particularly of encoding novel information. Now, as I said, um, the way um, the fMRI activity of, of encoding will be interpreted is in terms of deviance from young adults. So and the idea is if the network that a person uses deviates from young adults, that signifies already impairment because it signifies that there is a low maintenance of brain activity patterns in terms of their youthfulness. And this would already indicate that there is, um, that resilience mechanisms have to some extent failed. Can you actually see my mouse if I move it here over the screen? Probably not. Let's see. Yes, you can. can. Oh, you can? Okay, that's great. So maybe I can even have a pointer here. So the idea is that if the brain activity pattern of a person deviates from that of a young adult, then there is already some impairment. So pathology is already impacting um, brain activity. So there is low resilience. So this is where resilience fits in. Now, um, one, so there, there are many different possible um, relationships in this scenario, of course. So one possibility is that reserve, for instance, is associated with increased volumes of medial temporal lobe structures, but pathology has a negative influence on function, and this combination still gives you some normal cognitive performance. So that would be one possible outcome. Okay, so here are the three terms again. Of course, you know, what I presented to you uh, has already been in modification to some extent proposed by other people. Um, here are two publications from Cabeza and colleagues and from Jakob Stern. So um, in my talk, reserve is the availability of neural resources that can compensate for neurodegeneration or functional impairment. Maintenance is the preservation of neural resources over the adult lifespan in terms of structure and function, but I will focus mainly on function today. And resilience is a prevention of decline of neural resources, uh, structure and function in the face of pathology. So a decrease of activity maintenance in the face of pathology then indicates insufficient resilience. Now, um, in terms of biomarker status and the clinical um, populations we are going to look at, uh, let me just place them in the NIA research framework. So we're looking at um, amyloid positive versus amyloid negative individuals, so people with Alzheimer's pathologic change. And I will focus on individuals who are either cognitively normal and have no complaints or who have who are cognitively normal and have already subjective cognitive complaints. So we're looking at what has been proposed as stage one and stage two in terms of the clinical staging. Now let's look at the MTL first. Um, so the medial temporal lobe is, um, you know, a really fascinatingly architectural structure that 
uh, can be computationally described very well. Meanwhile, we know that there are many different processes or component processes of episodic memory. So now we're looking at processes that basically interact to enable episodic memory. So things like pattern separation, pattern completion. And um, these are assigned to different subfields. And I will not go too much into the detail of this, but um, you know, this is the predominant view of looking at MTL in terms of different processes. But another important view is to look at the MTL organization in terms of representations. Um, and this is a more recent idea that in addition to different processes, medial temporal lobe is organized in terms of pathways that um, provide different types of representational input into memory. And in particular, there is the idea that there's an object pathway. So there are object representations that enter through perirhinal cortex, transenterhinal cortex, and the more anterior parts of enterhinal into the hippocampus. And there is a scene pathway that um, particularly um, involves the parahippocampal cortex and more posterior parts of the enterhinal cortex. And this distinction is important because this anterior part um, here is affected by tau pathology earlier than this posterior part. And there is already some evidence, which is also highlighted here in the publications, that object processing uh, and impairments in object processing are particularly sensitive to tau pathology. So if you want to summarize this, and if you want to understand the effects of Alzheimer's disease on episodic memory, then really we have to keep in mind that we can do this in terms of component processes and in terms of representations. Now, when we look at component processes, people have usually used these agnostic to representational content. So using very abstract or symbolic patterns. But I think what we really need is a combination of those. So component processes and, and, and controlled representational content. And this is what we, um, you know, what you will see in my talk to some extent. So the data I'm going to talk about come from the German Center for Neurodegenerative Diseases. This is the Longitudinal Cognitive Impairment and Dementia Study. And um, this study has been ongoing now since uh, 2014, um, so for quite a while. It's a longitudinal study, so people, so participants have an annual follow-up. Um, and some participants have already had annual follow-ups of over five years. Um, so you can see here in this arrow, the clinical spectrum that uh, has been recruited into Dell code, uh, ranging from cognitively impaired to early AD. So we have, uh, uh, so uh, just to mention that Frank Jessen is the PI of, of uh, the Dell code study. Um, and there's uh, a very strong focus on subjective memory complaints so we have 200 healthy control subjects. We have first degree relatives of Alzheimer's patients, um, 400 subjective memory complainants, actually more than 400, I think 440. Um, and individuals with mild cognitive impairment and then with early Alzheimer's disease. This is a multi-center study. So it's basically uh, being conducted at 10 desert any sites distributed over Germany. Now, subjective complainers um, or subjective cognitive decline is um, defined um, by, the, by the following criteria. So these are individuals who present to a memory clinic with a complaint of cognitive decline. So they are not recruited through advertisement, but they, they present with, because of their complaints to GPs and then uh, uh, to memory clinics. And they perform better than 1.5 standard deviations of the age, sex, and education adjusted normal range of the SERA. And then they also fulfill the research criteria for subjective cognitive decline. Now, um, in, in the DELCODE code study, there is a very strong focus on functional networks. And uh, we do this, uh, and particularly on episodic memory, and Really, we do this uh, in the way I just outlined by looking both at processes and representations. So we are very interested in um, 
you know, very general novelty processing um, and recognition memory, but we also have um, fMRI tasks looking really at different types of representations such as scene and objects. So today I will particularly focus on this um, more, you know, general type of novelty encoding task. I will not show any fMRI data on object and scene processing, but I will show you some behavioral data uh, on that. So these fMRI tasks run on at, at different Desirene sites. There's a central QA and um, you know, very harmonized uh, imaging um, done on, these, um, on the fMRI acquisition. And, um, and then we also look at brain structure, of course. Um, and so as I said, I'm going to talk about medial temporal lobe regions. Um, so one challenge really is to look at particularly the subfields and the medial, the, the anatomical organization of the extra hippocampal medial temporal lobe. Um, it is notoriously difficult to segment these areas uh, accurately uh, because there's also a lot of in, you know, variability in the anatomy. For instance, the collateral sulcus is, can be very different from across individuals. So together with the University of Pennsylvania and the Allen Institute, um, we particularly David Byrne um, and Laura Wisser also um, uh, developed a new segmentation protocol um, that was based on seven Tesla uh, data. And we are, we, have, we are using this segmentation protocol uh, to segment the medial temporal lobe structures um, in, the, in the DELCODE study. And the way we do this is we are using an automated segmentation of hippocampal subfields algorithm developed by Paul Yushkevich, the ASHES uh, toolbox. Uh, and we use T2 weighted coronal MRI and T1 weighted scans um, to do this. Now we also have a very you know, strict quality assurance in terms of the segmentation success and the segmentation quality. So um, two well-trained individuals checked every segmentation of every individual, every slice to make sure that we excluded those segmentations that actually failed from the analysis. And for this, I'm very grateful to Zeren Yildirim and Firuza Delam from the University of Istanbul for this painstaking work. So I will start now with the analysis of the um, uh, medial temporal lobe subfields. Um, so just to um, uh, you know, look at this sample now. So this is basically the subsample where we actually have uh, sufficient subfield data to look at the comparison um, that we are interested in. So the particular question that we want to, that, so the, the samples that you are looking at are healthy controls and subjective complainers. Um, and so we're looking at amyloid negative or amyloid positive healthy controls or amyloid negative or amyloid positive uh, individuals with subjective memory complaints. So here you see the sample sizes. Amyloid positive and negative is uh, basically, um, sorry, I should have shown this, oh, is, is defined by the A beta 42 to 40 ratio. So, um, um, we are looking at, so we are basically for this analysis, um, looking at the hippocampal formation, which consists um, you know, mainly of the subfield CA1, dentate gyrus, CA3, CA2, trans transenterhinal cortex, and the enterhinal cortex. Um, and then we are looking at the parahippocampal region with the perirhinal cortex and the parahippocampal cortex. So what we did to look at the structural impact of amyloid in you know, stage one, these are the healthy controls, non-complaining, and stage two, uh, subjective complainers. We first did a multivariate ANOVA with either the hypocampal formation or the parahippocampal region. And so we are looking at the effect of diagnosis, healthy versus subjective complainer, amyloid status on the volumes with age, years of education, and total intracranial volume is covariance. So what we find is that in the hippocampal formation, there is basically no main effect of diagnosis. There is no main effect of amyloid status, but a significant interaction between amyloid status and diagnosis. Um, 
And we see the, this effect for the dentate gyrus, the CA3, CA2 region, and the transenteranal cortex. So in these areas, amyloid pathology has a stronger impact on subjective complainers than it has on healthy controls. And these effects are all significant uh, even after correction for multiple comparisons. So these are the correct p-values. And this is how the effect look like, looks like. So what you see here is um, on the x-axis, you see basically amyloid negative individuals and amyloid positive individuals. And the blue ones are those who are healthy non-complainers, so cognitively normal non-complainers, and the red are subjective complainers. And what you can see is that um, amyloid positive healthy controls and subjective complainers um, are significantly different in terms of their dentate gyrus volume. There is also a significantly lower volume when we compare the amyloid negative subjective complainers to the amyloid positive subjective complainers. But you can also see that when we look at the healthy controls, there is even a tendency to that the amyloid positive ones have larger volumes. And we see this also for other subfields. So here's CA3, CA2. And um, sorry, I, I don't have a picture now, but the enterhinal cortex, oh, sorry, the transenterhinal region looks very much like the dentate gyrus uh, in terms of the pattern. And so this is the CA3, CA2, as I just mentioned. And in the CA3, CA2, the increase in volume that we see for healthy controls from amyloid negative to amyloid positive is significant. Um, and I should men mention here that um, this effect that the volume here is in, you know, larger in the amyloid positive ones um, is um, reduced if we consider um, you know, reduced by taking the total cortical gray matter as a covariate. And, and when, we, when we follow this up, we see that the cortical, the, the whole cortical gray matter volume is actually larger in amyloid positive healthy controls than the amyloid negative healthy controls. And in addition, there's this CA3, CA2 effect, um, uh, which you know, has a specifically greater um, impact in the MTL, but there is a very general cortical gray matter effect uh, on top of it. Now, just so, you, so that you can see what happens if you include mild cognitive impairment in this analysis, um, then you, of course, see that, the, uh, and luckily, the, the, the expected stepwise um, impact on dentate gyrus volume, so the mild cognitive impairment individuals there in green. Okay, so this is the volume, um, the, the, the impact on medial temporal lobe volume. So of course now the question is, you know, what happens to, to function? Because we know that uh, episodic encoding should depend on these structures. Um, so the task that we use to assess function is a very simple scene novelty encoding task. So participants lie, uh, you know, while they are in the scanner, they see photographic images of either indoor or outdoor pictures. So here you see some typical examples. And then for each picture, they make a very simple button press. Uh, they say indoor or outdoor. Um, but some of the images are repeated over and over again. So that in the scanner, we have some highly repeated images. And this allows us to look at novelty activations. Then outside of the scanner, after 70 minutes delay, we also assess recognition memory um, for the images. Um, now we're looking at the novelty um, activation, so at the novelty encoding network. Um, so we measure the fMRI activity during encoding of novel photographs. And then we, we operationally define maintenance as similarity of a, the whole brain activation pattern to, the, to that of young adults. Um, so I've not shown this here, but we have data from over 100 young adults um, to actually define this activation pattern of young adults. And then we calculate a score and we call this score the fate score, so functional activity deviance in encoding. And that's basically a single number that gives that, that quantifies the network activity pattern difference. So 
this is explained a bit more in this slide. So this is the what you see here in these glass prints is the canonical activation novelty activation pattern. And so typically this involves the hippocampus, visual regions, uh, retrospinal regions, um, some basal ganglia regions, um, also actually some frontal regions. So this is a very conservative cutoff here. Um, and now we can take data from each individual older adult and do a statistical matching and then place these older adults along a dimension of low deviance, so high similarity or high deviance or low similarity. So everybody gets a single point, every individual, and we can look at the similarity. So we call this functional activity deviance in encoding. Now the way you can, you can calculate the similarity, of course there are many different ways, and um, this is basically work in progress, but for this, uh, and then, you know, for the, for the beginning, we used a very simple criterion. And we used the criterion that we define basically this volume of interest on the basis of the young group, and then just compare T values or subtract T values inside and outside of this volume of interest. So a very simple comparison. So these are the participants from which we have these fate scores. Um, so we have 55 cognitively normal relatives, so first degree relatives of AD patients. We have 163 cognitively normal older adults without complaints, 221 subjective complainers, and then 83 with mild cognitive impairment. These are the age ranges, and here you see the years of education uh, in the sample. Um, <clears throat> so first, um, just to get a feel for the data, here is some data on the recognition memory performance. So we can calculate D prime in terms of recognition memory accuracy. Um, and uh, now when we focus here on healthy controls, subjective complainers and MCI, we can see there's no significant difference from healthy controls to subjective complainers, but a drop uh, of course to mild cognitive impairment. So in terms of biomarker status, and I don't want to go into too much detail uh, here, um, the strongest correlation we find with the behavioral readout is with measures of tau. Um, amyloid load also correlates, but not as strongly. So here you see the correlation across all groups. Um, <clears throat> Um, now, how does the FATE data behave? So what you see here is the FATE score of each individual. Um, and um, in this plot, we just related to the recognition memory performance in the task. And here we related to age. And what you can see is, you know, when we look at the right side, um, there's a nice relationship to age in the sense that older individuals are more deviant, so have higher fate scores, they are more deviant from young individuals in terms of their network similarity to young adults. Um, and there's also a relationship with the performance in the task, so those who have lower D prime values are also more deviant in terms of the activation patterns. And these are you know, very significant relationships. This is really just to observe whether the measure, this fate score measure behaves uh, reasonably, um, and, and, and I think it does. Then, um, you know, as an exploratory analysis, we conducted a linear regression analysis with uh, different factors, uh, including um, amyloid pathology, D prime values, uh, years of education, uh, neuropsychological tests, uh, APOE status, and total and then tau pathology. And the factors that come out significant and that explain that have the strongest influence on, of, on whether an, an older adult shows active, you know, activates the same encoding network as a young person are age and um, the A beta 42 to 40 uh, levels in the CSF. Um, so years of education is only a marginal effect and tau has no effect. So when it comes to function and that's different from behavior, it turns out that amyloid has the strongest effect um, and tau really is not um, significant in terms of its, on the, on the functional similarity of a person to a young person. 
Um, and this is just to show you how the relationship looks like, and it is also, I think, well behaved. So you can see the fate score um, and its correlation to A beta 42 to 40 levels across uh, healthy control subject complainers and individuals with MCI. Here, the same with A beta 42. So, a very robust relationship there. But now comes the question, you know, what's, what do we observe when we actually do the same comparison, the, the same type of analysis of variance in terms of looking, uh, in terms of comparing healthy controls with subjective complainers who are either amyloid negative or amyloid positive. And what we see here now is different from the structural findings. Here now, the analysis of variance um, you know, we're comparing healthy controls to subjective complainers. Um, I should mention that now the healthy controls also include the cognitively normal relatives because otherwise we wouldn't have enough, enough uh, data for the healthy controls. And then we have amyloid status as a factor. So amyloid 42 to 40 negative or positive. And then again, we have core variates, age, years of education and total intracranial volume. And now we see a significant main effect of just the amyloid stasis. So it doesn't matter whether you are a healthy control or a subjective complainer, there's an overall impact of amyloid positivity, which makes your brain less similar to that of a young person. Um, this is plotted now in a, in a different way. Um, it's basically now we're looking at the fate score, but now it's normalized to healthy controls who are amyloid negative. So when a bar goes up, this means that an individual is more deviant from a young person than a healthy control who is uh, amyloid negative. And you can see that you know the amyloid positive group just has a stronger deviance um, than than. Uh, this uh, baseline that we introduced here. This really serves an as an illustration purpose to get a better feel for the data. Um, now, within the subject of complainers, um, which is an interesting group because they have obviously some degeneration um, or some, some, some atrophy already in the medial temporal lobe, unlike the healthy controls. And they have also a, a reduction in, in, um, in their functional similarity. Um, you can see that the FATE score uh, is related to, a, again, is correlated with A beta 42 to, and, and uh, A beta 40 levels in CSF. And these correlation plots, again, just to illustrate that, um, you know, this is a, a well behaved relationship. And so the findings are not driven by some outlier or so. Of course, we are also interested whether there is any relationship between the volumes that we find and the fate score. And within the subject of complainer group, there is. So the network similarity is related to the transenterhinal volume, and it is also related to the dentate gyrus volume. These are not really, I mean, these, the, the correlations look very good. They are, they are also significant. This is marginally significant, both corrected for age and education. But we don't see this in healthy controls. So when we look at healthy controls, there's actually no relationship between volume and, and, and functional similarity. So here, functional similarity is only uh, related, as we have seen in the ANOVA, to um, uh, a beta. Okay, now before I bring everything together, um, let's talk about the object versus scene distinction. Um, so this is a task that we also have introduced in their code. And um, uh, we've already published that um, in this task, you know, how this task relates to CSF tau and amyloid pathology. So what's this task about? So in the task, people see, you know, images of objects or scenes like this in a continuous fashion. And the objects are either repeated in an identical fashion or they're slightly modified like the sofa here or, or this table. Here. And the same is true with scenes and the modification with the scene is that we modify their borders, their, their scene layout. 
And when we look at healthy controls and subjective complainers together, so these are non-impaired individuals in Dell code, um, then there's a robust relationship in the object co condition and phosphor tau levels, um, which is stronger than the, con the relationship to the scene condition. So this is really what, you know, we would have expect in terms of the overlap between the suspected tau pathology spread and the networks that the object condition taps on. And uh, my colleague Anna Maas, uh, together with Bill Javis, used the same task also in Berkeley, and they found a very uh, similar uh, or, or corresponding relationship with tau pet. Now, um, what about the behavioral data? So what you see now is um, the discrimination performance um, in the object and scene condition. So we are plotting the correct mnemonic discrimination rate for healthy controls, subjective complainers, and MCI. And you see that healthy controls and subjective complainers don't differ in the object condition, but they robustly differ in the scene condition. Mild cognitively impaired people are equally impaired in the object and scene condition. And this is very interesting. So there seems to be something um, in the subjective complainers that impact scene, the scene condition in particular. And this fits actually quite nicely with something that Anna Maas published together with Bill Jagus, which suggests that the scene condition is maybe more vulnerable to amyloid distribution than to tau distribution. So there seems to be maybe some emerging picture here about the role of amyloid um, regard and the um, uh, and what happens in subjective complaints also in terms of um, cognitive impairment. Now that there is a, a deficit in mnemonic discrimination is particularly interesting because of course we have seen this um, effect of smaller volumes in the dentate gyrus. Uh, I've shown that previously in my previous slide. Uh, in subjective complainers. And the dentate gyrus is, of course, the region that we would suspect to be particularly important for this type of mnemonic discrimination. Okay, so I'm coming to the conclusion. So cognitively normal, healthy individuals. So we are looking at non-complainers now. Cognitively normal, non-complaining, healthy individuals who have amyloid pathology are likely to have larger hippocampal formation structures, particularly CA3 and CA2, in addition to having a larger cortical volume. And I think what this indicates is that they have a structural neural reserve to cope with amyloid pathology. So those that we classify as cognitively unimpaired and who also, who also have amyloid pathology are part uh, appear to be unimpaired because they have just more structural neural reserve. However, their brain signature of encoding already tends to be different from young adults. So in terms of function, they have already some form of impairment. So hence, while they have structural reserve, I would argue that they are functionally not resilient. So there's no way, there seems to be not a way for these healthy controls to maintain the same network as a young adult to the extent that um, an amyloid negative older adult would do. Of course, there is likely to be inter-individual differences, which are very interesting, but we haven't looked at those yet. Now, when we look at the subject of complainers, they differ from the non-complaining cognitive enormous because when they are amyloid positive, they have significantly smaller hippocampal volumes, particularly in the dentate gyrus. They have significantly impaired pattern separation processes for scenes. And again, their functional brain uh, signature of encoding is similarly different from young adults um, as, as the amyloid positive cognitively normal complainers. So I think what this means is that these subjective complainers, they lack the structural neural reserve that the non-complaining cognitively normal adults have, um, amyloid positive older adults have. Um, but in terms of the functional impact, they show the same uh, 
impact from amyloid pathology. So I think the conclusion could be that cognitively normal individuals with Alzheimer's pathologic change have a functional impairment as, which is evident um, as a decreased maintenance in clinical stages one and two. And that stage two is additionally characterized by a beginning neurodegeneration and by decreased structural neural reserve when we compare that pattern to non-complaining uh, cognitively normals. So just to bring this back to the scheme I started off with, I think what, when we look at the non-complaining older um, adults, I think what we see with amyloid pathology is that larger volumes provide some, some, some form of reserve. Um, but we already have some functional deviance from young adults. So there is, at least as a group, we could argue that um, uh, the cognitively normal pattern is not carried by functional resilience. But when we look at subjective complainers, we see that the MTL volumes already decrease. There is also functional deviance. And although overall there is normal cognition, there are very specific impairments already like that in the scene pattern separation. So some of the tests that I've just mentioned, um, we have also included as apps in the uh, DEL code study, and you can find some more information here. And this is it. Um, I would particularly like, of course, to the DEL code consortium, which is a very large, very well working consortium, very cooperative. And of course, to Frank Essen, who is the PI uh, of the DEL code uh, consortium, David um, Baron, um, who is currently with uh, uh, Oskar Hansen and Lund uh, has been very instrumental in, in the structural analysis uh, and also the object scene task and I'm grateful to the people from Istanbul for providing help with the ASHES segmentation and quality assurance. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Emra, for sharing this information. It was really uh, an exciting talk. Um, so uh, please uh, come forward with your questions. Um, Yakov, do I can start? <laughs> <laughs> that that was a great talk. That was very great. That was great. I you know it's um, it's interesting that just from a terminology point of view, um, you know it might be it might be interesting to put up your your um, that that slide with the various terms on it, or we don't. You don't have to. Um, I would say what you're seeing, um, where the people with larger brains um, seem to be more resistant to amyloid. That's what Kasman called brain brain reserve. That's what that's what Kasman called brain reserve. Uh, he saw it with larger brains and and plaques, uh, and some people were, uh, you know. So it, it's it doesn't have to do with the networks. The networks probably are a little impaired from what you're seeing, but they have larger brain, and that somehow allows them to. Uh, so that you know, that's you called it neural. What you call it, neural neural reserve, neural structural neural yeah. reserve. I think functional neural reserve. I think you know, and oh, like not I, really I, just, I, I just called it structural, structural neural reserve. Yeah. Structural neural. Reserve. That's what you know. Originally, you know, uh, in, even in the. Um, hmm in the um, white paper that you referenced, we call that brain, brain reserve. I mean, a lot of people didn't believe in it, uh, um, but there it is. Uh, and then I, I, the only other question I'd say is, when you start to look at the, um, what, what do you call the difference between the old and young and their utilization of these patterns? Um, the fade score. The fade score. You say you haven't really looked at, um, individual variability in the fade score is is your thought that maybe those people who are more even in the older people were on average they are poor are there some the people that are fade scores are better you, are, are you thinking maybe they'll look better cognitively as well yes exactly i think um you know a lot of aspects regarding um you know whether there are there are brain regions that that may provide additional and very specific types of reserve in this type of task. Yeah. Uh, in order to look at this, one would have to really classify individuals according to high and low fate scores and, and their 
neuropsychological test scores and then actually do this type of um, detailed yeah. analysis, which we haven't done yet. Yeah. Really. But I agree yeah. with the brain reserve. I think the, the reason why I use this very specific term is actually because I wanted to emphasize the difference between function and structure in this case. Yeah. Uh, and that's yeah. why, as you know, you could argue that the term brain reserve also is, is of course, very wide. It could also um, include ideas about brain function. So that's why, at least for the purpose of the talk, I use this very specific term. But I, yeah, you're right. I mean, it is, yeah. it is brain reserve, yeah. I think, I think, yeah, I mean, look, the terminal, the, the results are what are interesting, as I would say, the oper operationalization is what's interesting. And then your, and, and maintenance in your point of view is maintaining both brain and, and function. Yes, I'm, you know, um, of course, they don't have to go hand in hand. Um, um, so, as we have seen, you know, you can, you can have this brain reserve but already have a different um, network because there is pathology that basically affects the network. And we know that, of course, amyloid can have a, these oligomers can have a direct impact on, on, on brain function, right? So it doesn't yeah. always have to yeah. go through structure. So um, yes, it's both structure and function uh, with which you can, you know, uh, look at maintenance. But um, uh, I think, at least for the time being, where we don't really understand very well how they how they relate to each other, um, it may be meaningful to separate those out and then yeah. just say which type of maintenance you're looking at. Yeah, I think the people who describe maintenance were doing it in normal aging, so they, that was easy for them to say, um, yeah, both the structure is maintained and therefore the functional networks probably as well. But once you get into Alzheimer's or these pathologies, it's a different story. Thank you. I, I guess Lars is not online, but if you were Lars Nuberg, if you were online, you could tell us what. <laughs> yeah. We had coining the term, of course. Is there anybody, any, anybody else? Um, so while you are thinking about a question, maybe just you know to um, continue this uh, discussion a little bit. So uh, do you have any longitudinal data which may actually you know, also um, answer the question whether uh, it's not only brain reserve or structural neural reserve for those people, uh, you have a higher uh, brain volume and, uh, you know, but um, are healthy and, and uh, are beta positive, but um, may actually uh, show a different uh, decline in um, hippocampus uh, volume, you know, which would in, in your term uh, terminology probably correspond to um, resilience and you know others uh, may call this brain maintenance. Yeah, so we, um, I think the longitudinal data really will be key and um, we have longitudinal follow-ups uh, already um, I think two three years from most of the participants I showed but we haven't looked at those data yet so mm -hmm. I think the next step will be to look at the cognitive longitudinal trajectories so we can at least see how these measures relate to the cognitive decline trajectories, and then, then we will look at the MRs. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a lot of data to look at, um, and I hope that we can share some of this data with the Reserve and Resilience Network. Then. Great. There was actually an earlier question via the chat function um, during your talk. The question was, do you see any uh, laterality effect? So you focus mostly on the left side, um, but uh, so was it um, bihemispheric or you know, did you see this? Um, yeah, that's a really good question. So um, there is a, the reason why we focus, I mean, we actually focused on the left side. Um, so we have done this analysis only for the left now. And this is a very simple reason, which has to do with the Q Q uh, quality assurance that we did. Um, so when you look at the segmentation results, you can get a you know very nicely segmented left hip medial temporal lobe, but a less well segmented right medial temporal lobe. Um, and uh, so it's if you want both sides to be segmented well, you lose a lot of individuals. Um, and we will look at 
laterality, but in order to be able to do this, we have to manually correct the failed segmentations, and that takes a lot of time. So I'm waiting for the colleagues from Istanbul to actually do this, uh, and then we will be able to look at uh, laterality, but right now it's not possible. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, there is some indication that amyloid impacts, particularly the left hemisphere, so that's why we decided to look at, at this. But we are right now it's open. Okay, well, thank you very much. Are there any other questions? Now would be the chance. I don't Hi. see any. Yes. Sorry, um, this is Nayara Demnitz here, I'm calling from Trinity, Dublin. Um, I was curious about what you just said um, about um, the highest susceptibility in the left temporal lobe. Do you think that also links with some of the findings with laterality and effects of physical activity? Um, in particularly the left hippocampus. Interesting. Um, I don't know, actually. I haven't thought about this. Interesting suggestion. Mm. Thank you. Okay. Well, then, uh, thank you very much, um, Emma, for your, for your talk and uh, uh, to you all uh, for um, attending our talk today. See you next time again. Bye. Thank you. Bye.